Darwinism is supposed to be real science, but science can be objectively falsified. Like Darwinism, much of what is called science cannot be falsified because it is simply what people want to be true masquerading in scientific language. In the 19th century, there was the pseudoscience of phrenology. A Viennese physician by the name of Franz Gall argued that our intellect and personalities are based solely on the material factors of our brains. He claimed that each could be objectively measured by the size and shape of our skulls. Though phrenologists engaged in a great deal of data collection and accurately predicted that different areas of the brain control different functions, they pushed their conclusions far beyond the evidence to prove what they wanted to believe. For example, they claimed this new scientific discipline confirmed the inferiority of non-Europeans. Robert Fitzroy, the captain of the HMS Beagle, was an ardent phrenologist who nearly rejected Darwin from the voyage to the Galapagos because of the shape of his head. Evolutionists like to contrast Fitzroy's pseudoscience with what they believe to be the hard science of Darwin. They ignore that Darwin had also been an advocate of phrenology. Many educated people were. They convinced themselves that if they were capable of doing chemistry and physics, everything they believed must be rational. But unlike real sciences, phrenology did not make predictions that could be objectively falsified. It simply interpreted data in ways that conformed to the prejudices of the phrenologist. In spite of all its claims, phrenology eventually faded into history. But other pseudosciences have arisen in its place, all demanding to be seen as true. Nearly a century after Franz Gall, another Viennese physician, Sigmund Freud, promoted his new science of psychoanalysis. As with Gall, Freud's so-called science was not falsifiable. And as with Gall, Freud developed a cult of personality by helping others justify what they wanted to believe. What Freud wanted to believe was that the cocaine he enjoyed was not addictive, that he wasn't alone in lusting after his mother, and above all, that there was no God. The ordinary man cannot imagine this providence in any other form but that of a greatly exalted father, for only such a one could understand the needs of the sons of men, or be softened by their prayers and placated by the signs of their remorse. The whole thing is so patently infantile, so incongruous with reality, that to one whose attitude to humanity is friendly, it is painful to think that the great majority of mortals will never be able to rise above this view of life. Despite the aura of science that Freud projected, he confided to a friend, I am actually not at all a man of science, not an observer, not an experimenter, not a thinker. I am by temperament nothing but a conquistador, an adventurer if you want to translate it, with all the curiosity, daring and tenacity characteristic of a man of this sort. The history of psychiatry since Freud has not been much better. It has promoted electroshock therapy and lobotomies. The latter was the basis of Egas Moniz winning the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1949. In the 80s and 90s, the fad was repressed memories and it was all supposed to be settled science. Until 1973, the American Psychiatric Association classified homosexuality as a mental disorder. But in the face of loud protest and disruptions at its conventions, it simply redefined its science. It continues to do so. In 2013, the APA ceased to identify transvestism as a mental disorder. Instead, it is now considered a mental disorder to believe that homosexuality and transvestism are disordered. In 2019, the American Psychological Association declared traditional masculinity harmful, saying it can lead to homophobia and sexual harassment. None of this is real science. It is simply progressivist morality masquerading as science. The scientific method is not subject to political correctness, and real science can be falsified. In 1919, a solar eclipse allowed Einstein's theory of general relativity to be tested. As predicted, the light of a star behind the sun was bent so as to become visible. 
For Richard Dawkins and his fellow evolutionists, there is no way to falsify their theories. Because Darwinism is as much a pseudoscience as phrenology and psychiatry. Instead of making predictions that can be objectively tested, it makes assumptions about an unobservable past, a past very unlike the present, where life could simply spring into existence. For much of human history, the idea of spontaneous generation has had its proponents. Aristotle argued that scallops are produced from sand and oysters from slime. By the 19th century, many such ideas had been debunked, but fermentation was still considered proof that life could arise simply through exposure to air. In 1859, Louis Pasteur demonstrated that it was not the air, but microbes in the air that caused fermentation. He did so with experiments that anyone could replicate. All subsequent experiments show the same thing that Pasteur found, that life comes from life, never from non-living matter. Darwinism is not about experimentation, but imagining a warm little pond in the distant past where the right conditions somehow produce something no laboratory can replicate. Like phrenology and psychoanalysis, it is about massaging data to fit a predetermined theory. Though Darwinists pretend theirs is the obvious interpretation of this data, that is not the case. Here's a helpful way to look at the problem Darwin faced. Climbing a mountain. Let's call it Mount Improbable. Let's say at the bottom we have the simple bacterial beginnings of life on Earth. At the top, man today, or any complicated piece of biology. So, how did we get to the top? If it had happened by blind chance, or by design, it would be equivalent to leaping up a sheer cliff in a single bound. Utterly out of the question. If we come round the other side of Mount Improbable, we find something very different. Here there's no sudden precipitous cliff. Here there's a gentle slope, a gradient of evolution. All we have to do is put one foot in front of the other and we'll get to the top. Darwin's great insight was that life evolved steadily and slowly, inching its way gradually over four billion years. Natural selection, not a divine designer was the sculptor of life. Under the microscopes of Darwin's day, cells seemed very simple. The idea of such cells arising spontaneously and mutating into higher forms of life seemed reasonable. But modern technology has allowed us to see deep inside these cells and demonstrated a complexity far beyond anything Darwin could have imagined. Red blood cells are so small that over 150 billion could fit in a cubic inch. Besides highly complex organelles and mechanisms that Darwin never saw, in the nucleus of new blood cells is a coil of DNA that if unwound would stretch roughly six feet. The average person has about 10 billion miles of DNA in their body, enough to stretch back and forth to the sun over 100 times. The smallest genome ever discovered is in a simple bacteria, but even it has nearly 160,000 base pairs. The smallest changes in physiology that Darwinism requires involve elaborate changes in the genetic code. The gentle slope of evolution is gone, and we are back to a sheer cliff of irreducible complexity. Darwinists try to overcome that cliff with logical sleights of hand. If pesticides kill off non resistant insects, and resistant ones proliferate, this is supposed to prove Darwinism. But this involves the loss of genetic material within a population, not the additions required to make higher forms of life possible. Such reductions make up much of the supposed evidence for Darwinism. All domestic dogs descend from the wolf. Various traits were purposely bred out to produce the diversity we now have. Intentional breeding among rabbits has resulted in such variety that some can no longer successfully reproduce with one another. 
Darwinists point to this as the creation of new species, as if it's the same as the development of a higher form of life. But it's not. The rabbits are still rabbits, and no breeding program can change that. Countless generations of fruit flies have been raised in laboratories. Scientists manage to produce a fly with an extra set of wings, but the wings don't work, and the fly is incapable of living outside the lab. Because there are limits to biological change that make Darwinism impossible. You can breed wolves down to chihuahuas, but you cannot breed chihuahuas back to wolves, much less a dolphin or a human. Without experiments to support their theories, evolutionists turn to interpreting the fossil record. But as with other pseudosciences, their history is littered with wild exaggerations and blatant attempts at fraud. Inspired by reading The Origin of Species, German biologist Ernst Haeckel produced his own work in 1866, claiming that embryology supported Darwin. He produced detailed illustrations, showing that vertebrates all develop similarly. His diagrams became standard for textbooks for well over a century. Haeckel was praised as a great scientist and founded the Association for the Propagation of Ethical Atheism. The problem was that the illustrations were fake. The images were doctored to prove what Haeckel wanted to be true. Critics pointed out his misrepresentations soon after their publication, but it would take over a century for Darwinists to admit to the fraud. In the meantime, Haeckel speculated that Indonesia would be a proper place to find the missing link between ape and man. In 1893, one of his disciples, Eugene Dubois, went to Java with the express purpose of finding that missing link. When he dug up an ape's skull cap and a human thigh bone within 40 to 50 feet of one another, he insisted that they must be from the same skeleton, and the discovery of Java Man was announced. In 1912, the New York Times reported that Darwin had been proven true, this time by the discovery of Piltdown Man. Portions of a skull were discovered in England and supposedly provided another link between apes and humans. For over 40 years, it was included in school textbooks as evidence that Darwinism was real science. Finally, in 1954, it was discovered that the skull was a hoax, perpetrated by combining a medieval human skull with the lower jaw of an orangutan and chimpanzee teeth that had been filed to fit. Someone had created the appearance of age by staining the bones with an iron solution and chromic acid. Ten years after the supposed discovery at Piltdown, Henry Osborne, the president of the American Museum of Natural History, announced yet another missing link, Nebraska Man. It fit neatly into what Osborne wanted to be true, but all his claims rested on a single tooth that eventually was revealed to belong to an extinct pig. The modern missing link is supposed to be Lucy. Everything about her skeleton was ape-like except the hip. But as with her predecessors, that hip demonstrates that Darwinism is not about following the evidence, but making the evidence fit an existing theory. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Einstein's theory made quantifiable predictions. What does Darwin's theory predict? The survival of the fittest. And how do we know which are the fittest? It's those which survive. This is not science, but a tautology. Everything supposedly proves Darwinism, yet nothing does in the same way as in the hard sciences of chemistry and physics. Darwinists claim to find simpler organisms in older rocks and more complex organisms in younger rocks. 
This sounds persuasive, until you realize that they not only date the fossils by the rocks, but the rocks by the fossils. Darwin knew that the fossils he had available did not demonstrate gradual change over time, with a multitude of intermediate forms. But he was convinced that as more data was collected, his theory would be confirmed. The last century and a half has only strengthened the evidence that animals appear suddenly in the fossil record and remain relatively unchanged, the very opposite of what Darwin predicted. In 1972, Harvard professor Stephen Jay Gould, along with Niles Eldridge, formulated a revised theory of evolution called punctuated equilibrium. They criticized the scientific community's commitment to gradual change as based on ideology rather than real science. The general preference that so many of us hold for gradualism is a metaphysical stance embedded in the modern history of Western cultures. It is not a high-order empirical observation induced from the objective study of nature. They explained away the problems of the fossil record by arguing that at various points in history, mutation took place so quickly it simply was not captured in the fossil record. This leaves Darwinism without empirical testing and without the fossil record. Yet atheists still demand that it be seen as science. Though fossils are open to interpretation, there is a history to Darwinism that is much more objectively evaluated. Most American high school students have been forced to watch Inherit the Wind. Despite changing the names, the film claims to be a faithful account of the Scopes Monkey Trial. An earnest high school teacher is jailed and threatened by fundamentalist Christians for daring to teach evolution, contrary to Tennessee state law. Well, good morning, young ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, visitors. For our science lesson for today, we will continue our discussion of Darwin's theory of the descent of man. Now, as I told you yesterday, Darwin's theory tells us that man evolved from a lower order of animals. From the first wiggly protozoa here in the sea, to the ape, and finally, to man. Now, some of you fellas out there are probably going to say that's why some of us act like monkeys. <laughs> but what Mr. Charles Darwin was trying to tell us in his own way... Bertram T. Cates. Come off it, Sam. You've known me all my life. Bert, you're charged with violation of Public Act 31428, Volume 37, Statute Number 31428 of the State Code which makes it unlawful for any teacher of the public schools to teach any theory that denies the creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Bertram Cates, I hereby place you under arrest. <laughs> Here's another one. Monkey shines in Hillsboro. The whole world's laughing at it. Look, from Chicago. Heavenly Hillsboro. Does it have a hole in its head? Or its head in a hole? I'm telling you, we've gone too far. Let them laugh. We fight in the Lord's battle, ain't we, Reverend? Well, I decide I'd rather have some heathen laughing at me than to have my sons laughing at my Bible. Like so many atheist histories, this one falls apart on closer examination. Tennessee had passed a law for public schools that made it a misdemeanor to teach that humans had evolved from apes. But the governor insisted that it would never be enforced. Despite this, the American Civil Liberties Union announced that they were looking for a test case and would defend anyone accused of teaching evolution. George Rappelier was a transplanted New Yorker who managed the Cumberland Coal and Iron Company in Dayton, Tennessee. On April 5, 1925, he approached the county superintendent of schools, Walter White, and local attorney, Sue Hicks. Dayton was suffering economically at the time, and Rappelier believed that a trial would give the town some much-needed publicity. The three convinced their friend, John Scopes, 
a 24-year-old football coach and sometimes substitute biology teacher, to be arrested for having taught evolution. Though the school's textbook included evolution, Scopes would admit after the trial that he had never actually taught it, but that was irrelevant to their plans. Scopes was arrested, but the popular coach was never jailed. The law only called for a misdemeanor fine. In the movie version, he's jailed throughout the trial and threatened with lynching. Clarence Darrow, a member of the ACLU, volunteered to defend Scopes, but told the jury the only conclusion they could reach was guilty. His hope was that the ACLU could appeal the case to the Supreme Court and have the law declared unconstitutional. When Scopes was given a $100 fine, the prosecutor, William Jennings Bryan, offered to pay it for him. Rather than reaching the Supreme Court, the conviction was later thrown out on a technicality. Rather than being a victim, John Scopes would later say, I've often said that there's more intolerance in higher education than in all the mountains of Tennessee. When retelling this story, atheists turn a publicity stunt into a near lynching. In seeking support for his nonprofit foundation, Richard Dawkins promises. Number three, change the culture. How do you do that? by sponsoring, commissioning, and producing plays and movies, helping high schools across the country put on Inherit the Wind. Richard Dawkins is well aware of these facts, but he's still promoting Inherit the Wind. If we know that he and the Darwinists are lying to us about a history we can objectively verify, why should we trust them about any other history? Darwinists also gloss over what was taught by the textbook at the center of the controversy. The races of man. At the present time, there exist upon the earth five races or varieties of man, each very different from the other in instincts, social customs, and to an extent in structure. These are the Ethiopian or Negro type, originating in Africa, the Malay or Brown race from the islands of the Pacific, the American Indian, the Mongolian or Yellow race, including the natives of China, Japan, and the Eskimos. And finally, the highest type of all, the Caucasians, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Considering where such thinking led, and the horrors done by Hitler in the name of helping evolution along, it shouldn't surprise us that Richard Dawkins tries to distance Darwin from him. I should here mention the popular canard about Hitler being inspired by Darwin. It comes partly from the fact that both Hitler and Darwin were impressed by something that everybody has known for centuries. You can breed animals for desired qualities. Hitler aspired to turn this common knowledge to the human species. Darwin didn't. His inspiration took him in a much more interesting and original direction. Darwin's great insight was that you don't need a breeding agent at all. Nature, raw survival or differential reproductive success can play the role of breeder. As for Hitler's social Darwinism, his belief in a struggle between races, that is actually very un-Darwinian. For Darwin, the struggle for existence was a struggle between individuals within a species, not between species, races, or other groups. Don't be misled by the ill-chosen and unfortunate subtitle of Darwin's great book, The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. It is abundantly clear from the text itself that Darwin didn't mean races in the sense of a group of people, animals or plants, connected by common descent or origin. Is Dawkins telling us the truth? Let's see what Darwin actually said. At some future period, not very distant, as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes, as Professor Schaffhausen has remarked, will no doubt be exterminated. The break will then be rendered wider, 
for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we may hope, than the Caucasian, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as at present between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Francis Galton, Darwin's cousin, had no question as to what Darwin was teaching. He incorporated these ideas into a new science that he labeled eugenics. There is nothing, either in the history of domestic animals or in that of evolution, to make us doubt that a race of sane men may be formed who shall be as much superior mentally and morally to the modern European as the modern European is to the lowest of the Negro races. Charles Darwin's son, Leonard, also seemed to be clear as to the implications. He became the head of the English Eugenic Society. But it was in the United States that eugenics became particularly popular. Birth control is not contraception indiscriminately and thoughtlessly practiced. It means the release and cultivation of the better racial elements in our society and the gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extirpation of defective stocks, those human weeds which threaten the blooming of the finest flowers of American civilization. 37 states eventually created eugenics laws, and tens of thousands of U.S. women were sterilized against their wills. Even the Supreme Court refused to intervene. But it was in Germany that Darwin's views were taken to their most hideous links. But atheists try to avoid this fact by claiming that Hitler was actually a Christian. They base this on him being baptized as an infant and using Christian language in his public speeches. Their reading of history is very selective. The official religion of the Nazis was called positive Christianity, but it promoted a Jesus who was neither Jewish nor divine. It was a religion in which the swastika was added to the cross. But Hitler was the voice of God. Hitler's Reich Minister of Church Affairs, Hans Kurl, described it. Positive Christianity is National Socialism. Dr. Zöllner and Count Galin have tried to make clear to me that Christianity consists in faith in Christ as the Son of God. That makes me laugh. True Christianity is represented by the party, and the German people are now called by the party, and especially by the Führer to a real Christianity. The Führer is the herald of a new revelation. Hitler's head of the Nazi party chancellery, Martin Bormann, was even more clear in a directive to other government officials. National socialist and Christian concepts are incompatible. The Christian churches built upon the ignorance of men and strive to keep large portions of the people in ignorance because only in this way can the Christian churches maintain their power. On the other hand, National Socialism is based on scientific foundations. When we National Socialists speak of a belief in God, by God we do not understand as do naive Christians and their clerical beneficiaries, a man-like being who is sitting around in some corner of the sphere, the force which moves all these bodies in the universe in accordance with natural law is what we call the Almighty or God. It shouldn't surprise us that Hitler sought to wrap his ideology up in religious terms palatable to the populace. Hitler's private statements make his views even more clear. You see, it's been our misfortune to have the wrong religion. Why didn't we have the religion of the Japanese who regard sacrifice for the fatherland as the highest good? The Mohammedan religion too would have been much more compatible to us than Christianity. Why did it have to be Christianity with its meekness and flabbiness? Our epoch will certainly see the end of the disease of Christianity. It will last another hundred years, two hundred years perhaps. My regret will have been that I couldn't, like whoever the prophet was, behold the promised land from afar.
Despite atheist claims, Hitler was no Christian. He was actively hostile to the Jesus of the Bible. Whether or not he should be seen as a strict atheist or a pantheist is a matter of debate. But even Richard Dawkins will sometimes admit that he really was a Darwinian. Now, you are right when you say that aspects of what Hitler tried to do could be regarded as arising out of Darwinian natural selection. That's exactly why I said that I despise Darwinian natural selection as a motto for how we should live. I tried to say we should not live by Darwinian principles, but Darwinian principles explain how we got here and why we exist in the scientific sense. Atheists use Darwinism to dismiss God, but then they pretend they can avoid its obvious implications. How different is Dawkins' alternative from the forced sterilization and genocide of Darwinism? It turns out not much. 